Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Monday. I hope uh, everyone's recovered from prom and uh, had a fine time uh, on what turned out to be a glorious weekend, weather-wise. Uh, as you can see, I have with me today John Podesta, Senior Advisor to the President. He is no stranger to many of you or even to this briefing room. Uh, he's here to talk about uh, issues ar around energy and energy efficiency that uh, the President will be uh, discussing uh, this week. He'll make a presentation at the top and stay for questions uh, on his issue areas, uh, as we traditionally do. If you could direct questions to him at the top, and then when that's done, uh, we'll let him go, and I'll uh, remain for questions on other subjects. And with that, I give you John Podesta. Thank you, Jay. It's good to be back here. Um, and not really. <laughs> <laughs> you know I don't lie. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, I'm going to run through a, f a, a few uh, slides, as, as Jay noted. Uh, President Obama pledged to make 2014 a year of action, uh, and the administration and the American economy are, are firing out all, on all cylinders when it comes to producing more energy, cleaner energy, and more energy efficiency, as well as combating climate change. Uh, we prepared uh, a few slides because we're doing a number of activities this week uh, to give you some background and, and provide some context uh, that were done by the CEA. Jason's uh, out of town today, so forgive me, I don't have a PhD in economics, but I think I can walk you through these uh, slides. Uh, the first one, we'll click and I think you all have copies. The United States is now the largest producer of natural gas in the world and the largest producer of gas and oil in the world. Uh, it's project projected that the U.S. will continue to be the largest producer of natural gas through 2030. Uh, for six straight months now, we've produced more oil here at home than we've imported from overseas. Uh, so that's all a, a, all a good news story. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, domestic energy production is boosting economic growth overall. Uh, in 2012 and 2013, it accounted for 0.22 and 0.24 percent of growth, which is the highest uh, on record. Um, if you go to the next slide, as you can see, that's had a direct Im uh, impact on, on employment. We've added 133,000 jobs uh, in the last three years in the oil and natural gas extraction sector, uh, and those numbers are projected to continue to grow. Next slide, please. Uh, but at the same time as we've been producing more oil and natural gas at home, we're cutting our en energy usage, dramatically improving energy efficiency. Uh, that's part of what the President means uh, when he says that we have an all-of-the-above energy strategy, trying to produce, produce more uh, domestic energy, but also uh, using it in a much more efficient way. Uh, as this uh, slide shows, the, the efficiency standards like the fuel economy standards finalized in 2012 are driving down the amount of energy necessary to produce a dollar's worth of goods or services. Uh, consumption of gasoline is well below the expected trend lines uh, that you can see from 2006 and even uh, 2010. Uh, that's expected as the uh, energy efficiency standards uh, come into place that go out to 2025. That's expected to uh, save consumers $1.7 trillion. To go to the next slide. Uh, and we're evolve, uh, evolving a cleaner overall energy mix, even as we boost domestic oil and natural gas uh, production and improve efficiency. Renewable energy is on the rise. It's some of the fastest growing part of our energy uh, mix. Cleaner burning natural gas is the only fossil fuel that's growing as a share of the energy mix. These trends will uh, keep the United States economy competitive. They'll keep the U.S. economy growing. They'll help us achieve the President's goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the range of 17 percent below 2005 levels uh, by 2020. And please, the next slide. Uh, since uh, President Obama took office, we've increased elec uh, electri electricity generation from solar by more than 10 times and tripled electricity production from wind power. Last year, solar energy was the second largest source of new electricity added to the grid. Uh, after natural gas. Every four minutes, another home or business went solar. Federal government is doing uh, its part to make sure that these trends continue and more energy is produced by clean renewable sources like wind and solar. 
Uh, five years ago, there was not one renewable energy project on the hundreds of millions of acres of public lands. Today, DOI is on track to issuing permits uh, for enough renewable energy generation on public lands to power six million homes. And finally, the next, last slide, please. Uh, power plants that create electricity by burning fossil fuels are still the largest single source of CO2 emissions in the U.S. In 2012, they've accounted for 38 percent of CO2 emissions and 31 percent of greenhouse gas emissions overall. The transition to natural gas increases in efficiency and deployment of more renewables uh, has meant that our CO2 emissions from energy production are trending in the right way, and that is down, uh, but we have more work to do. So that's what we're up to this week, and I'll uh, just finish with uh, a, uh, just to give you a, a sense of uh, where we are. We're working every day to, inter, uh, to implement the President's Climate Action Plan. Uh, we've made, I think, important uh, gains on all three fronts of the Climate Action Plan that he re released last year, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, as I've talked about, building resilience in American communities to the climate impacts we know are coming. Uh, and leading the international negotiations to tackle this global challenge. This week, we're taking further actions. An important part of the Climate Action Plan was calling on uh, the uh, calling forth the National Climate Assessment. That will be released tomorrow here at the White House. As part of that release, the President will be spending some time speaking to meteorologists about what the report's findings will mean for communities across America. This third national climate assessment will be the most authoritative and comprehensive source of scientific information ever produced about how climate change is going to impact all regions of the United States and key sectors of the national economy. Uh, there, it's been a tremendous uh, undertaking. Hundreds of the best climate scientists from across the U.S., not just in the public sector but in the private sector as well, have uh, worked over the last uh, four years to produce this report. This assessment is about uh, presenting actionable science. We expect it will obtain a huge amount of practical, usable knowledge that state and local decision makers can take advantage of as they plan on uh, for the impacts of climate change and work to make their communities more resilient. Uh, later in the week, starting on Wednesday, the administration is going to be holding a three-day Better Building Summit here in Washington. Uh, in February of 2011, the President launched the Better Buildings Challenge to help American commercial and industrial buildings become at least 20 percent more efficient by 2020. More than 120 diverse organizations representing over 2 billion square feet of real estate are already on track to meet that 2020 goal and cut their energy use by 2.5 percent annually. Uh, these efforts obviously save families and businesses money on their utility bills, they reduce energy demand, and they help us to achieve our climate goals by reduce, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, th this week's events will highlight progress on for our private and public sector. And then finally, coming out of last month's White House Solar Summit and anticipating this week's Better Building Summit, the President uh, has been using the power of his phone, uh, and all of us in the White House have been working to get more commitments from more partners on these key sectors uh, to get more efficiency in our built sector, more deployment of solar uh, across the economy. We'll have some announcements of that at the end of the week. Uh, we uh, obviously need all hands on deck if we're going to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change. The impacts that the IPCC uh, warned us about just a month or so ago and that, that the National Climate Assessment will bring into sharp focus with respect to the U.S. So with that, let me uh, go ahead and take some questions. Julie Pace. Thank you. Um, I had a question on uh, power plants. You mentioned this briefly as it relates to your last slide. Can you give us any sense about what the president is planning on that front in terms of executive actions and regulations perhaps later this year? Well, obviously the president has asked the uh, uh, EPA to move forward to regulate uh, existing power plants under the Clean Air Act. Uh, he set a June 1 deadline. I think we, are, we will meet that or be close to it. Uh, and uh, the, the EPA has uh, modeled uh, proposal that's being uh, reviewed through an interagency process right now. So we will propose, we'll have a proposed rule out in the beginning of June. Mark. Um, one of the charts that you showed, showed a declining use of gasoline and a greater energy, uh, greater, more efficient use of gasoline. An impact of that is that the Highway Trust Fund is running out of funds. The Highway Trust Fund, as you know, has been 
the source of funding for uh, infrastructure repair in this country. Uh, to what extent would the administration support an increase in the gas tax to replenish that fund or replace funding in some other way? Well, as you know, we just put forward a, uh, a bill on surface transportation which replaces it in a different way, but you've raised an important point. The stable funding uh, for the great uh, infrastructure needs that the United States uh, is currently uh, experiencing, uh, whether that's crumbling roads and bridges or uh, building a more modern infrastructure across the board uh, to move uh, our goods and freight more efficiently, to uh, make the uh, driving experience more efficient, building more transit to move people uh, inside uh, urban environments is a, is a pressing need. But the Secretary of Transportation just sent legislation to the uh, Hill last week on Thursday, I think. Uh, that uh, that covers the, the both what we need to do and how to pay for it. John, Carl, um, your chart shows uh, we've been a big story for a while the, uh, the rapid increase in natural gas uh, production, um, which is much cleaner than coal. Obviously, a lot a lot good about that. Is there how much of an environmental downside? Has there been to this, this boom and fracking? And well, for the most for the most part, there's been upside as we've seen uh, uh, cleaner natural gas replacing uh, dirtier fossil fuels in the in the electricity system in particular. Uh, but there is a concern about uh, 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 that uh, gas that's fracked, if you will, that that's produced through that method uh, is done in the in the cleanest, most efficient way. In particular, uh, the the uh, uh, administration released a methane strategy a couple of weeks ago that goes to the question of how we ensure that the best production methods are used uh, in the production of both uh, oil and gas in, the, in, in that process. For the most part, that's regulated at the state level, but I think there, there are uh, ways in which uh, that the United States can, uh, the, the federal government can take steps to ensure that we use the best practices, capture that methane, uh, and ensure that, which is a, a, a of course has a, uh, a heavy effect on the climate if it's just uh, allowed to be released into the atmosphere. But I think there are ways of, uh, to control that, and, and we're working uh, both in uh, discussing that with uh, both at the oil and gas production level and also at the transportation level. Secretary of Energy has had uh, intensive negotiations or not negotiations discussions with uh, the transportation people because there's a lot of leakage in the in the system at that level as well we need to get the we need to get those uh, that methane leakage down but I think there are practical ways to do that Peter Alexander uh, Mr. Vanessa, thank you uh, is it possible for the president as A's have suggested to have climate change be one of the key components of his legacy and also to support the Keystone Pipeline. Are those two things in conflict, or can he accomplish both of those at once? I'm going to leave that one to Jay. As I think you know, uh, when I came here, I said I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to work on uh, the Keystone Pipeline. So I'll just defer that to, to a later question. Bill, uh, given the fact that most of the extraction stuff is regulated by state governments, what can the federal government do to assure that water quality is unharmed? The geologic disturbances, all of this reported very much by people, local people, uh, where the fracking is taking place. Well, I think we have uh, resources at, at EPA that certainly can support this, and at the Department of Energy, which is, uh, has a major research program going on this, to provide uh, state regulators the, you know, up-to-date up uh, scientific knowledge about uh, the way, the best practices that can be uh, utilized. Uh, but at this, at this point, I think uh, we're, we're trying to work with the states uh, to ensure that people can be reassured. And obviously, uh, different states are going different ways on, on that question in terms of providing effective uh, regulation of uh, oil and gas, gas production or deciding to have no production at all. But there's no government, I mean, there's no federal regulation. The, well, I think that, uh, again, the methane strategy will uh, produce, again, uh, some steps to deal with that issue. But for the issue around uh, particularly fracking fluids is, is largely managed at the state level. Alexis. John, when, um, when Democratic candidates hear from <coughs> either their opponents or challengers that they're not supportive of the oil and gas industry, that the administration is not um, being supportive. 
when you look at this data and they look at this data, what is the message that they have to counter those criticisms that this administration is against oil and gas? Well, I, obviously, we've seen a big increase uh, in both oil and, and uh, gas production. I don't think you would have seen that if you didn't have a practical approach. Obviously, in the first term that we went through uh, the largest oil spill uh, uh, in the country's history with the, with the uh, BP spill in the Gulf, uh, but we're back on track to produce more uh, oil and gas uh, in the Gulf itself, and I think with uh, better procedures for making sure that that's done in a safe and effective and environmentally friendly way. So I think that the, the, uh, I think the, uh, the statistics that I just presented belie the, the, the argument. People will make that argument, but I think that if you look at the overall, as I said, the overall mix, it's cleaner, it's more domestically produced. Uh, we've uh, uh, turned the corner so that we're now producing more oil than we're importing. Those are all facts that I think that uh, that are, can be utilized by candidates to make the case that we're on the right path to have a, a, a cleaner, better, uh, and more secure, uh, more American-made uh, energy future for the country. Steve. Yeah, Mr. Podesta, um, this is really sort of, it seems like the centerpiece of the President's pen and phone agenda is energy and climate, something he can't really get much out of Congress. But you said we need all hands on deck. Is there anything that you think can get through Congress this year anything that you're working on or that you see happening in Congress? Well, the Senate's taking up energy efficiency legislation this week. We'll see if they, that can get passed uh, and get onto the floor. It's a, you know, it's a, it's an important bill. It's a, it, it will uh, move us in the right direction on energy efficiency, but there's still a question of whether that'll be filibustered so they won't be able to get to it, uh, you know, this week. Mr. Podesta, you, you mentioned uh, the catastrophic impact of climate change. Uh, as you survey uh, everything that you've seen coming in, what do you think are the areas that, uh, that need the most immediate federal attention on this? So much has been written about it, how far off it is, and so forth. Well, I think that, that uh, again, we put out uh, at climate.data.gov uh, a, a first tranche of information about sea level rise. Uh, that's particularly uh, going to be going to affect communities on the eastern seaboard in Florida, uh, in the, uh, you know, in, in the Gulf. Uh, so the, I think that's building resilience towards what is almost, what is certain to be uh, a rising sea, uh, uh, sea level uh, is something that communities need to grapple with and need to grapple with it right now in terms of their, their infrastructure investments, how they're thinking uh, about the future. And obviously we're in the midst of experiencing uh, major droughts in California, uh, in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, that comes, that's, comes along with greater fire risk, uh, and uh, the administration has put forward uh, a new way of budgeting uh, on, the, on the question of, of fire risk going forward, and we're seeing that already uh, in, with intense uh, uh, fires already in the, in the plains in Oklahoma and California. Uh, so I think if, if you had to, uh, if you have to pick two, I would say those would be two good ones to, to attend to. But as, as you know, Peter, the President uh, recommended a, a billion dollar fund uh, in this year's budget that would begin to support communities uh, to develop uh, re climate resilience plans and do better planning to uh, take a look at what, what you'll see tomorrow, which is a national climate assessment which begins, it doesn't localize it uh, per se, but it begins to take the climate discussion down to a regional level. So it breaks the country apart, anticipates what's going to happen in each region. It has another separate breakout on what's happening to the ocean uh, and to the oceans because of increased acidification, what the, the effect of that may be uh, on uh, the productive economies that are around. Uh, the, the, you know, particularly coastal communities and ocean-oriented uh, economies. Uh, so I think that kind of information will help communities plan, and uh, the funding that we've proposed, I think, will provide the resources that uh, would be useful to give communities a, uh, a jump start on, on their planning. Some uh, communities are obviously are already on top of that uh, as a result of catastrophic events, really, the, you know, particularly uh, as a result of uh, what happened in the Gulf with Katrina and what happened with uh, Superstorm Sandy in, in the Northeast. The climate change doubters, you say what? I, 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 I'd say that uh, 
probably look out your window and you and and you'll you'll be begin to feel the effects but 97 percent of scientists agree there's an overwhelming amount of evidence uh, that exists that climate change is real it's happening it's caused by uh, the uh, co2 pollution and other uh, uh, you know uh, uh, pollutants that we're putting into our air, our, our air that cause uh, climate change it's well-known science now the data continues to come in if anything we're seeing some of the effects that are predicted by the models coming in more quickly uh, than they uh, than were predicted in the in the models that that existed even a decade ago so I think if you want to try to if you particularly if you if you're uh, want to try to side with the polluters and argue to the American public that uh, climate change is not happening uh, today, tomorrow, and certainly in the future, that's going to be a losing argument. Mike, this, uh, the statistics you presented pretty much read like a wholehearted endorsement of, of fracking. And when the president was in Brussels uh, a couple of months ago, he spoke laudably of fracking, recommending that Eastern Europeans step up their technology. <coughs> so my question is, is fracking the answer to the world's energy needs, or is fracking a disincentive to develop renewable energy? No, I think, again, we, we put a major emphasis, and I, I quoted the statistics, 10 time increase in solar, three times increase in wind. We're very committed to renewable uh, energy. But at this moment, as a, as a bridge, if you will, from a, uh, a world in which there's still uh, uh, needs for fossil fuels to power our economy to a world in which we can get more from uh, zero carbon source energy, whether that's be, uh, through new technology because we can sequester the carbon that's coming from the release uh, in, in uh, power plants or from more renewables in the system, more zero carbon source uh, energy in the system. We think it's a, it's a practical and viable way uh, to reduce uh, emissions uh, in the short run. So there are obviously there are environmental issues around uh, the production of, uh, of gas and oil, uh, but again, in the administration's view, those can be uh, that can be dealt with through uh, the proper application of the best practices uh, to produce that oil and gas. Time for one more. Um, you mentioned the energy efficiency bill moving to the Senate. I was wondering uh, what level of concern you have the Republicans going to try to tack on kind of a pushback on some of the carbon emissions regulations to that bill, and what work, if any, you guys are doing to shore up Democrats in the Senate? Well, I, I think that, the, you know, the, the uh, question of whether they would, you know, they'll, they'll find various ways, particularly in the House, to try to stop us from using the authority we have under the, uh, under the Clean Air Act. All I, all I would say is that those have zero percent chance of working. Uh, we're committed to moving forward with those rules. We're committed to maintaining the authority and the President's authority to ensure that the Clean Air Act is fully implemented. That's critical to the uh, health of the American people, the health of the economy, and the health of our environment. So they may try, but I think that there's, there, there are no takers uh, uh, at this end uh, of, of Pennsylvania Avenue. And I think with respect to the uh, commitment of Democrats to, to support uh, a, a cleaner energy future, I think there's a you know, strong sentiment there. There's quite a bit of organization that's uh, led, uh, uh, particularly by Senator Whitehouse now uh, in the Senate, Senator Boxer and others, uh, Senator Markey and others, to to sh to ensure that we get the right outcome. So, uh, again, this is bipartisan legislation on efficiency. We hope that it uh, gets to the floor. We hope that it passes. But it's if it passes with unacceptable riders, then it'll be headed to the, you know to uh, the watery depths, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, John. Okay. I uh, want to thank uh, John Podesta for joining us today. Uh, you'll be hearing uh, more from the President uh, this week on those issues. And with that, I go to Julie Pace once again. Thanks, Jay. Um, the violence in Ukraine has spread into Odessa. And I'm wondering if the fact that it's now in a city of a million people, a strategically important port city, if that impacts the U.S. calculus at all in terms of the response, ratcheting up a response more quickly? Julie, we remain extremely concerned by the deteriorating situation in uh, both eastern and southern 
uh, Ukraine, where pro-Russian militants uh, who are armed uh, have escalated their already violent behavior and taken over additional government buildings in yet more towns. Uh, Odessa, as you know, uh, is in southern Ukraine. Uh, you know, we're going to continue to call on Russia to live up to its uh, commitments in Geneva uh, to, and to use its influence over these groups, these uh, pro-Russian militant groups, uh, to urge them to disarm and to instead engage in Ukraine's political uh, process. When it comes to Odessa, I want to reiterate uh, that we mourn with all Ukrainians uh, the heartbreaking loss of life there uh, on Friday, the violence and mayhem that led to so many senseless, uh, senseless deaths and injuries is unacceptable. Uh, we call on all sides to work together to restore calm and law and order. Uh, and we call on the Ukrainian authorities to launch a full investigation and to bring all of those responsible to justice. The events in Odessa dramatically underscore the need for an immediate de-escalation of tensions in Ukraine. The violence and efforts to destabilize the country must end. And we again call for the immediate implementation of the commitments made in Geneva on April 17th. When it comes to the general principle of violating a sovereign state's territorial integrity, seeking to destabilize uh, a sovereign state, uh, the actions of Russia, uh, regardless of where they take place within Ukraine, are very, very serious. And we have called them out and we have called on them uh, to use their influence, that is, Russian leaders, to use their influence to uh, prevail upon militants uh, in eastern and southern Ukraine to uh, disarm, to vacate the buildings they've occupied, uh, and to uh, engage in the political process in Ukraine. As you know, there are elections scheduled for May 25th in just a few weeks, uh, and that is an opportunity for every Ukrainian regardless of his or her political views, uh, to uh, take advantage of the democratic process to express their will. That's how it should be. Ukrainians must decide for themselves uh, the future of Ukraine. It is not for uh, another nation or for militants within a nation supported by and abetted by uh, another nation uh, to force uh, anything upon the people of Ukraine. But it sounds like you're saying that in terms of the U.S. response, the U.S.-Europe response, that nothing is really going to change in terms of your timeline and your set of options, even though this crisis has now moved into a pretty major city. Well, again, I, I think that we have, from day one, escalated our uh, actions that impose costs on Russia, as Russia has escalated its interference in and efforts to destabilize Ukraine. And as the President made clear last week when we announced new sanctions, uh, in coordination with our European and G7 partners, those costs will continue to escalate. We have a wide range of tools available to us, uh, up to and including sectoral sanctions. And uh, should Russia take actions that we and our partners decide or view as uh, meriting further escalation of costs on Russia, then, then that's what we will do. We will impose those costs. And the authorities the President has available to him under the executive orders he signed give him uh, a flexible range of tools to impose further costs and higher costs on Russia. And we will continue to uh, ramp up those costs, ratchet up those costs, if, uh, if and as Russia uh, continues to engage in efforts to destabilize Ukraine and fail to and fails to uh, honor the commitments that Russia made in Geneva on April 17th. And just quickly, does the White House plan to cooperate with uh, the House Select Committee on Benghazi? You know, one thing this Congress is not short on is investigations into what happened before, during, and after the attacks in Benghazi. Seven, seven rather, separate congressional committees uh, in investigations, rather, have been looking at this since 2012, including the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, the House Armed Services Committee, the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and the Senate Armed Services Committee. All told, these investigations have consumed 13 hearings, 50 member and staff briefings, and over 25,000 pages of documents. 
And yet what we said at the time remains true today. In the days after September 11, 2012, we were concerned by the unrest occurring across the Muslim world, and we provided our best assessment of what was happening at the time. And all of these investigations, in addition to the work of the Independent Accountability Review Board, chaired by the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff appointed by George W. Bush, have found that the facts as we described them, in terms of how we approach this, uh, remain exactly as we described them then. The facts of yesterday are the facts today, and they will be the facts no matter how often or for how long Republicans engage in highly partisan efforts to politicize what was a tragedy, a tragedy that led to the deaths of four Americans, brave Americans serving overseas, representing the United States of America. And from day one, the President has been committed to uh, finding out what went wrong there, why security was inac uh, inadequate. Uh, and in pursuing those responsible for the deaths of Americans uh, and bringing them to justice. And that effort will not cease. The effort to uh, take action to uh, make changes because of what we saw in Benghazi when it comes to the security of our diplomats and our facilities uh, is embodied in the immediate response that the administration took uh, once the Accountability Review Board put out its report, which was unsparing uh, in its assessments of the problems that existed that helped uh, lead to that uh, tragedy. And uh, then Secretary of State Clinton uh, adopted all 29 of the ARB's recommendations and began implementing them right away. The President uh, insisted uh, that that take place, and that's what's happening. So we are going to uh, continue focusing on the need to make sure that our uh, diplomats uh, and other Americans serving abroad are as safe as they can be. We call upon uh, Republicans to uh, take a little of the time they spend investigating investigations uh, or voting to repeal a law they will not repeal uh, and uh, focus on providing the funding necessary so that we can uh, adequately uh, provide security to our uh, brave Americans serving overseas. I want to let you get on to my colleagues, but that doesn't mm -hmm. answer the question of whether you're going to cooperate with the committee or not. Julie, we have uh, always cooperated with legitimate oversight. Uh, that's represented by the statistics I just read to you. All of the seven separate congressional investigations, all of the committees that have participated in those investigations, all of the uh, administration personnel who have uh, briefed or testified because of those investigations, everyone who cooperated. Legitimate oversight? I, I think if you look at even what some Republicans have said, uh, it certainly cast doubt on the legitimacy of an effort that is uh, so partisan in nature. Now, there is a a problem when you have so many conspiracy theories that get knocked down by the facts, and yet the adherents to those theories only become more convinced uh, that uh, the facts aren't what they so clearly are. And that information loop is fed by, uh, you know, authorities who, in the Republican Party in this case, reconfirm for those who want to believe in conspiracy theories that don't uh, have any factual basis, uh, but tell them they're true anyway, by media outlets that pound that message in to those who are predisposed to believe it, who, for example, continue to assert that there was a military stand-down order which has been refuted uh, forthrightly by the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who investigated it and made sure that it was not true. You know, at some point you just have to assume Republicans will uh, continue this because it feeds uh, a political objective of some sort. Uh, but I think it, at the same time you have to ask, you know, what about the American people who want to see Congress actually work for them, who want to see Congress take action to raise the minimum wage? or take care of the millions of Americans who are looking for work whose benefits were cut off because uh, Republicans would not extend them, who want Congress to help build on the recovery we've seen, 50 months of private sector job creation, uh, so that we invest in infrastructure, education, or uh, innovation. They're doing none of that. Instead, they're investigating and investigating and investigating investigations and voting, of course, periodically to repeal the Affordable Care Act. 
Michelle. Well, I think that the allegation on the other side would be that there was an attempt to politicize it with, with the talking points, that that was some effort on that side to do so. So, I mean, don't you feel like you need to get that message out more strongly, that, that it wasn't a politic politicization on the White House's part after the fact? I think at some point it becomes necessary to actually uh, look at what we're talking about and review the history. Within hours, not days, not weeks, within hours of the very attack that we're talking about, the Republican nominee for president issued a scathingly political statement that was actually pointed out as such by many of you in this room or your organizations. And that effort to politicize this tragedy has continued unabated since. You know, we can, and I'm, perhaps we will, go over again and again you know, what the assessment was by the CIA, the points that the CIA drew up and provided to members of Congress of both parties who requested them so they could talk about it publicly, and that we provided to uh, our representative who was going out to talk about them publicly. And the fact that that, was, that assessment by the intelligence community was based on what was said clearly to be early information, the best available information at the time, uh, and that as more information became available, uh, it was corrected. But at some point, as I was saying before, the facts begin not to matter to those who fervently want to believe in something else. And when they are constantly uh, reaffirmed in their beliefs by those who seek to gain some sort of political traction by reaffirming those beliefs, uh, the, the facts themselves, the documents themselves, the testimony, what Admiral Mullen said, what the deputy director of the CIA said, what Ambassador Pickering said, what then Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta said, none of that matters anymore if you want to believe in a certain set of conspiracies. So, uh, you know, we're going to continue focusing on the facts and what matters about this episode, which is to bring to justice the four, I mean, the, those who were responsible for the deaths of four Americans, and that effort will, uh, will not end and will not flag until it is accomplished. And then uh, to implement, hopefully with Congress's help, uh, all of the recommendations in the Accountability Review Board's report, which include beefing up, hopefully with funding provided by a Congress that seems otherwise focused on other matters, uh, beefing up security at diplomatic institution, uh, 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 installations around the world, uh, so that all those Americans who serve unquestionably without some, with some risk in dangerous places representing us uh, are better protected. And if you don't mind if I change the subject quickly, um, on the Nigerian girls, um, I, I think a report just passed while we were sitting in here that U.S. officials are heading to Nigeria. Can you clarify the U.S. response? Uh, is it going to go beyond intelligence sharing or is it already? What I can tell you is that uh, we view what has happened there as an outrage and a terrible tragedy. The President has been briefed uh, several times and his national security team continues to monitor the situation there closely. The State Department has been in regular touch with the Nigerian government about what we might do to help support its efforts to find and free these young women. As Secretary Kerry said, we will continue to provide counterterrorism assistance to help Nigerian authorities develop a comprehensive approach uh, to bat combating uh, Boko Haram. We continue to stand firmly with the people of Nigeria in their efforts to bring the terrorist violence uh, perpetrated by Boko Haram uh, to an end while ensuring civilian protection and respect for human rights. When it comes to what specifically we are doing, uh, we've, our counterterrorism assistance to Nigeria focuses on information sharing, on improving Nigeria's forensics and investigative capacity. It also stresses the importance of protecting civilians and ensuring that human rights are protected and respected. Uh, we are working with the Nigerian government to strengthen uh, its criminal justice system and increase confidence in the government by supporting its efforts to hold those responsible for violence accountable. Uh, you know, there are other things, I'm sure, specifics that the State Department can provide to you, but uh, this is an outrage and a tragedy, and we are uh, doing what we can to assist uh, the Nigerian government uh, to support its efforts to find and free uh, the young women who were abducted.
Mark. Jay, thank you. Um, just on the uh, energy issue, mm -hmm. if I go back to the energy efficiency bill, John Podesta said that the administration <coughs> supports that, but if there are uh, unacceptable riders attached to it, uh, it wouldn't stand a chance of getting the president's signature. As you know, there are uh, efforts to attach to provisions that would approve the Keystone pipeline. Would that be an automatic veto well, trigger? On I, I'm not going to speculate, but I think you have seen from what we have said and done in the past that uh, it is our strong view that uh, the process around the decision-making uh, on that pipeline has to be uh, compartmentalized out of politics, housed and run at the State Department. Uh, that has been the case in previous, uh, previous administrations of both parties, uh, and it is the case uh, with this pipeline. In the past, when Congress has acted, uh, it has actually served to uh, slow down uh, the review process, and, and we uh, believe strongly that that's uh, not an effective or helpful way uh, to uh, bring that process to a conclusion. So I'm not going to speculate about what Congress may or may not do. We would be here all day. Uh, in the end, it tends not to do much. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue to focus on the issues that John talked about. Follow up on the response that he gave to the to the gas tax question. Um, I realize you've made your proposal how to, to replenish the highway uh, trust fund, but would a gas tax also be something that the administration would? Uh, we have never reject? proposed uh, or supported a gas tax. Uh, let me, Tommy. Next thing, um, I have two questions for you on Benghazi. Uh, first of all, um, there's a clip of uh, Mike Morales getting a lot of play now with mm -hmm. this new email where he, he talks about reacting to Ambassador Rice's testimony that uh, the video was not something that our analysts attributed the attack to. But in the first part of that statement, he says that, you know, his reaction to her uh, Sunday show appearance was that when she talked about the protests, that was based on the best information at the time, right in that same sentence. Mm -hmm. And the protests were because of the video. Well, here, so, I, I think mean, I can help you yeah, sort of, I mean, uh, tease this out. If you look at the points that uh, Mr. Morell has many times uh, said publicly that he uh, oversaw and took responsibility for, uh, the, the first sentence essentially says, uh, based on a currently available information, uh, the, uh, what happened in Benghazi arose out of, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, protests at Benghazi that were inspired by demonstrations uh, outside of the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. And there is no question that, like the demonstrations around so many uh, of our diplomatic facilities in the Muslim world at that time, the demonstrations outside of our embassy in Cairo were uh, inspired by uh, anger over uh, the video in question. So uh, I think that clearly explains what uh, was at issue in the CIA talking points, what have been described as the CIA talking points, and what the sort of connection between based on currently available information was being made uh, at the time uh, between the demonstrations over the video and what happened in Benghazi. Again, is what, we, what we've said all along and what CIA has said, uh, other intelligence uh, uh, community leaders have said, what folks in this administration have said, is that when uh, more information became available, we made it available to the public through you. And, you know, in a situation like that, it is obviously uh, uh, you know, complex in the sense that you have uh, an event like that happening across the world. You have concurrently uh, demonstrations highly uh, violent and potentially uh, uh, very damaging uh, uh, demonstrations happening outside of uh, diplomatic facilities uh, across the Muslim world that threatened at least to become even more severe, and uh, that was something that was of great concern to uh, national security officials both here and across the administration and across the world, as you would expect it would be. Uh, and uh, I think that is the context in which to understand, uh, you know, how the talking points were developed and, and what everyone was saying about them at the time, and the fact that there was contradictory information. Uh, at the time, said there and sort of saying that that supports whatever they're trying I mean, to do with this email. But when I, my question is, um, what he's saying there doesn't seem to make any sense to me. He says, yes, it was the protest, which were about the video, but it's not about the video. So yeah. my question is, uh, Tommy, I would just say I didn't see uh, specifically his that testimony. What I can tell you is that. 
Mr. Morrell has, uh, on repeated occasions, uh, made clear that those talking points uh, were overseen by him, developed by the intelligence community, were based on the best available information they had at the time, were produced at the request of and on behalf of members of Congress of both parties who wanted to be able to answer questions publicly about uh, the event, and that we uh, used the same points and, uh, and provided them to our representative who went out uh, to talk about it publicly. Uh, and he has also made clear and testified uh, that uh, he felt no, absolutely no political uh, influence uh, as he was developing those points. So, you know, taking us, you know, sort of dialing it back a year to when we had these discussions the last time, that was, that was the focus of everyone's attention. And it was because uh, that process in developing those points had been mischaracterized because of the partisan political effort on the Hill by Republicans to reporters that uh, we voluntarily uh, put out uh, the documentation that backed up what we were saying and what Mr. Morrell was saying. The unfortunate thing about all of this is that, in the end, it, ta it distracts from what the focus should be, which is that we need to uh, take action to ensure that there's uh, better security for uh, Americans, uh, civilian Americans serving abroad at our diplomatic facilities, many of them in countries where uh, there are inherent risks to Americans. Uh, and we need to continue the effort to uh, hunt down and bring to justice those responsible for the deaths of four Americans. That's the President's focus, and we, uh, we wish that it was the focus of members of Congress as well. Alexis. Second, second oh, sorry, question. Tommy. Uh, my, I, Tommy had a second one. Go ahead. Yeah, my, my second question is this. You know, it, it's been, I, you just sort of mentioned it there, it's, it's been almost a year to the day now when uh, reports uh, emerged. There were reporters saying that they had obtained emails uh, that proved that the White House had politicized the creation of the talking points. And then, as you said, that uh, it turned out these were not actual emails. They were inaccurate summaries mm -hmm. that were fed to them by Republicans uh, in Congress. Now we, you, we go fast forward a year later, and you've got the same reporters saying that they now have an email that proves the same thing. So I guess what I want to know is it, it seems like you're expecting the American people. How do you expect them to believe that the same guy is wrong about the exact same thing Two years well, in a Tommy, row. I, I, mean, I think our interest really is not in playing that game. It's in uh, making clear that we're focused on we're focused on on you know the things I talked about, uh, ensuring that our diplomats are secure, and we need Congress's help. We need Republicans' help in providing the funding necessary to take care of that. Uh, that is reflected in the request in the president's budget, uh, and in and in continuing the investigation uh, uh, and the effort to bring to justice those who killed four Americans. Uh, the rest of this, or so much of the rest of this, is so clearly uh, and unfortunately partisan, uh, you know, that I, f I suspect, as I said earlier, that no matter how many committees look into it and how many investigations of investigations of investigations there are, or, ho or how many highly credentialed uh, and admired uh, people in the military and our civilian service who testify to the facts that the, when the facts won't be enough, the, the, the political partisan uh, process will continue. And that's unfortunate for only one reason, which is that uh, we all have a limited amount of time in the day uh, to focus on things, and that includes members of Congress. And all the time they spend investigating this and investigating other matters, uh, or voting to repeal a bill or a law that has led to more than 8 million Americans signing up for private health insurance, the, the, uh, the less time they have to try to focus on the things that Americans really care about, uh, which is the economy and helping it grow and investing in a way that uh, rewards uh, hardworking Americans for the hard work they do. Okay. You called him Alexis. Alexis. You called him Alexis. 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 So just you're out there, well, April. You're defending I didn't, I didn't. your colleagues, and I appreciate that. She was excellent in that video, wasn't she? Oh, thank you. Oh. Did she good? Two that, was, that was that was a, a great production. Sorry, go ahead. Two so, uh, just to follow up on Julie's question, you went to which great, one? About Benghazi. Uh -huh. You went to great lengths to suggest that because it's a partisan political effort on the Capitol Hill, and the White House, the administration is not going to cooperate with a select committee investigation. Because of the amount of time that you just spent in the briefing room and would, we would assume, be spending talking about this again when they get going, just to clarify, the administration is not going to cooperate. Again, I would point you to the fact that we have always cooperated with legitimate oversight. 
uh, and will continue to do so. And we have cooperated extensively, cooperated extensively with the oversight on this matter, which I think a lot of folks, including Republicans, have identified as not always legitimate but highly political. Uh, I, I don't think there's, uh, there are many people, including if you look at some of the Republicans on the uh, Sunday shows yesterday, who believe that this is uh, necessary after uh, seven congressional investigations and multiple committees have looked into it. Uh, you know, and so I think you, you, know, you can make your assessment about how serious it is and how serious uh, minded an approach is, which is so clearly designed to uh, politicize what was a tragedy uh, that, again, is perpetuates a, it's like a, it's a conspiracy theory without a conspiracy. Uh, fundamentally, it has always been about, you know, were we trying to, uh, you know, you know, per, uh, perpetuate a, a myth about what happened in Benghazi when within, I mean, once the intelligence community changed its assessment, we put it right out there. And, you know, it was a murky situation in which we were providing the best available information, conservatively relying on the intelligence community's uh, assessment uh, that it was providing to Congress. And when uh, that assessment changed, of course, our assessment changed. Uh, and I think if you look at it, it still remains murky exactly what happened, and we'll never know until the investigations are complete and the and investigation into who killed those Americans is complete and they're brought to justice. But that's, as I said before, at some point when the conspiracy theories sort of fall flat and yet there is a fierce adherence to the notion that the conspiracy exists, you know, you just have to continue to focus on getting uh, work done that's important to the American people. And you know, we can talk about this as much as you want in this room, uh, but it's not going to change the facts, because none of this is going to change the facts as they existed then, as they exist now, or they will in the future. They're, they're not going to change. Our Arkansas. There mm -hmm. are folks in Arkansas who are wondering why it took the President so long to come to their state, which he will be this week. Can you just comment on why it took a long time for President Obama to get there? Well, I'm not, I, again, I, I haven't seen those comments. The President is visiting uh, in two days. I'm sorry. So just, that just people are saying that he, it took him a long time. To oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, not not after the disaster. I, again, I don't even know how to respond to that except to say the president is focused and will be focused uh, when he visits on Wednesday on uh, the families of victims and on uh, the first responders and on the efforts underway to uh, help uh, Arkansas rebuild. Wendell. How much of your skepticism of this committee is uh, fueled by? Um, Speaker Vander's appointment of Trey Gowdy as the chair, and Gowdy a member of the Oversight Committee, which has been pretty tough on you guys. Uh, I, I think my, my view on this has less to do with personalities than on the fact that there have been nothing but investigations into this matter for the past 18 months by multiple committees uh, with 25,000 plus pages of documents turned over many, many briefings, much testimony, uh, and uh, all have, uh, you know, failed to provide Republicans what they have desired politically, which is uh, some proof of a, of a conspiracy. And, and remember, this all began with an, a statement put out by the Republican nominee for president within hours of the attack. Uh, and the effort to politicize this has continued unabated, uh, which is unfortunate. But it is what it is, and uh, it has been what it has been, and I suppose this won't change, just like the facts won't change. Uh, but we're going to continue to focus on uh, the things that I think the American people wish Washington were more focused on, which is uh, the kinds of issues that Mr. Podesta, John Podesta, was talking about earlier, which is, you know, how do we uh, make the kind of investments that assure that we uh, get the national security advantage that comes from greater energy independence, as well as the economic and uh, environmental advantage that comes from it, so that our air is cleaner for our children, our water is cleaner for our children, and we are safer uh, and uh, more economically efficient. They're, these are the kinds of things, and that we're creating all the jobs that come with these kinds of investments. Uh, I think that is probably a lot higher on the list of uh, average Americans in terms of what they'd see, what they'd rather see Washington do than, you know, layering on another investigation by the same folks of the things they've already investigated. Senators, uh, McCain, Graham, and Ayotte want to confirm a report by a former White House staffer that the President did not monitor the uh, 
the events uh, going down in Benghazi from the Situation Room that night. Can you confirm that? Uh, what I can tell you is that the President uh, was uh, briefed uh, regularly by his senior national security team uh, as in events were unfolding. As you may recall, he was first alerted to the attack in Benghazi while he was meeting with uh, Leon Panetta in the Oval Office. And uh, at that moment, uh, told Secretary of Defense Panetta that he wanted every uh, effort expended to uh, do everything we can to uh, assist in the situation in Benghazi and make sure that our diplomats were secure around the globe. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was constantly updated. We put out photographs of that. Uh, you know, again, it's, this is a conspiracy theory in search of a conspiracy, and it is, uh, has clearly been that for so long now uh, that, I, that I've lost track of the number of conspiracies that have fallen flat. Conspiracy theories. Yeah. On, on another subject, on Ukraine, are you concerned that the, this uptick in violence has spread to Odessa, uh, the continuing violence in East Ukraine, really threatens the um, May 25th elections? And are you likely to tighten sanctions before then, as some have called on you to do? We are concerned that Russia seeks to undermine the May 25th elections. And as the President said last week, we will be uh, working with our European and G7 partners to uh, respond appropriately should uh, that be the case. It is uh, vitally important that the Ukrainian people get to express their free democratic will in national elections uh, and that every Ukrainian avails himself or herself of the right to vote and votes according to his or her convictions. That's how the process uh, should work. Uh, it is not for Moscow to dictate to Ukraine or to Ukrainians uh, what uh, the future of Ukraine should be. Uh, and uh, yes, we're very concerned, and I think we've made clear that as uh, Russia escalates uh, its efforts to destabilize uh, the situation in Ukraine, the cost to Russia will escalate. We have uh, a very f uh, flexible set of tools available to us to impose uh, additional costs, and that is, as you saw last week, uh, up to and including uh, sectoral sanctions on the economy, on the Russian economy. Carol, and then John. Uh, on the abduction of the Nigerian girls, are, can you talk about what kind of assistance the U.S. is planning to offer the Nigerian government just beyond basic intelligence and information sharing? Well, we're also pursuing efforts to help uh, the Nigerian military improve its professional military education to bolster its counter IED capacity and carry out uh, responsible CT operations. Uh, in addition, the United States last year provided approximately $3 million in law enforcement assistance to Nigeria, which included uh, assistance to develop uh, the Nigerian capacity to search, identify, identify mitigate, and dispose uh, of IEDs and related materials. A resident legal attache in Lagos and FBI agents who have assisted Nigerian authorities in investigating bombings there and training for Nigerian law enforcement officials on basic forensics interview and interrogation techniques, hostage negotiations, leadership and management development, and task force uh, development. So uh, the U.S. also supports programs and initiatives that provide positive alternatives uh, to communities most at risk of radicalization and recruitment, including through vocational training. Um, and I think it's important to note that at last year we designated Boko Haram as a foreign terrorist organization and specially designated global terrorists, which effectively cuts the organization off uh, from U.S. financial institutions and enabled <laughs> banks to freeze assets here in the United States. And quickly to follow on Wendell in Ukraine, just to be clear, is it fair to say you, you, the administration is considering additional sanctions against Russia before the May 25th elections based on things that are, are currently happening and the violence that we've seen in the last few days? Mm -hmm. guess, what we're trying to get a sense of is whether May 25th is a hard deadline for any new <laughs> sanctions or if you're leaving open the possibility of still levying some type of sanctions against Russia between now and then based on action that's been happening the last few days or could happen in the uh, next few days. The latter is the case. We have never set artificial deadlines on when we would begin considering new sanctions. We've always made clear that the tools available to the President uh, allow uh, him and this administration to uh, escalate the costs if activity by uh, Russia uh, aimed at destabilizing Ukraine escalates. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not saying, I, nor am I saying that sanctions are coming on any particular day or will come on any particular day if Russia does uh, this particular action. We've made clear 
that if Russia escalates, uh, the costs will escalate. And uh, we are coordinating very closely, as you heard uh, the President and Chancellor Merkel discuss last week, with our uh, allies and partners in Europe and on the G7, and we'll continue to do that. One other quick housekeeping thing. So do you consider the Select Committee investigation legitimate? That's housekeeping? Yes, because everyone's <laughs> asked you, and we <laughs> take a clear answer. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I, that's, uh, there is a speculative nature to that. Like we, uh, you know, I don't know. What I know is that you Republicans continue to obsess. No, I haven't. I mean, you're saying it without uh, saying it. You're saying you've always cooperated with legitimate mm -hmm. investigations, but suggesting that you're not going to cooperate with this, or at least that it isn't. You don't see it as a legitimate investigation. So, do you see it as a legitimate investigation? What I'm not going to do is 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 speculate about what might come, or what Republicans are going to do, or what you know, how that's going to play out. I think the action in that, on that front is on Capitol Hill right now. What I will remind you of is our history of cooperation on this issue and many others. Uh, and I will point to you the, uh, point out to you the, you know, remarkable amount of time and energy uh, spent by uh, various committees uh, in seven different investigations into this very matter. And I will point you to the ARB investigation and to the conclusions that uh, Ambassador Pickering and Admiral Mullen uh, drew in their report and the recommendations they made, <coughs> the clear-eyed assessments they made about some of the conspiracy theories propounded by uh, Republicans and others on this issue, uh, and to testimony by Mike Morell and, and others uh, on these matters. And, and again, what you have here is uh, dissatisfaction over, I guess, the failure to prove any of these theories true, and thus a decision to, you know, do it again, try it again, investigate the investigation. And, uh, you know, we're going to focus on uh, where we can move forward on behalf of the American people uh, to grow the economy. I, you know, again, we cooperate with legitimate congressional oversight. John. So, so I just wanted to... Do you want to ask me again? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 <laughs> actually, I, I just want to direct... You're going to definitely get it out of yes. me, that's for sure. Yes. Yes or no answer. <laughs> gotcha. Is the White House going to cooperate with this investigation? Yes or no? I've heard a lot well, of first words. First of all, I haven't seen an answer. investigation. I've seen a lot of uh, rhetoric. I've seen talk. I've seen um, some of the usual partisan uh, uh, assertions and heard them. And what, I, what I will say is that we uh, have uh, a long history of cooperating with legitimate oversight from Congress. I heard uh, and that, that. I heard cooperation that. will continue. What I I'm not going to speculate about is what, uh, you know, what the Republicans are up to. It's pretty blatantly apparent, apparent based on what they've said and what even other Republicans have said, that this is a highly partisan exercise. Uh, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go further than that. <laughs> would the, would the, uh, Tommy, is that you? Who, whose awesome ringtone is that? Would, is, is, is the White House encouraging Democrats to take part in this, to appoint members to this committee, or? We leave it up to uh, Leader Pelosi and, and Democrats on the Hill to decide how they want to approach this. And, and, and can I ask a follow-up on the, on the Nigeria question? Uh, yeah. Is, is the White House, does the White House believe that the Nigerian government is doing everything that it can do to free those girls? What I can say, John, is, is what we're doing to assist them and how uh, outrageous uh, this uh, abduction is. Uh, there is no question that Boko Haram is a terrorist organization uh, with uh, heinous and malicious intent, and uh, we are going to do everything we can to assist uh, Nigeria in their efforts to find and free uh, those young women, those girls. Would it be impolite April. to point out that that doesn't answer the question? Yeah. Uh, it would be. April. Um, Jay, a couple questions. Um, back on the Benghazi investigation, mm -hmm. there seems to be frustration on Capitol Hill particularly on behalf of Nancy Pelosi when it comes to Republican efforts on this latest um, issue with Benghazi. What is the level of frustration with President Obama when it comes to this latest probe? April, I would simply say that uh, as you heard the President discuss in his State of the Union address and have seen in the actions that he's taken this year, he sees 2014 as an opportunity to get things done for the American people, as a year of action. And he made clear at the beginning of the year and has proven in the actions that he's taken all year uh, that where Congress will not join him in an effort to move forward and make progress on behalf of the American people, 
he will act using uh, any authority he has uh, to advance those interests, to help the economy, to help uh, hardworking Americans and reward hard work. Uh, that's what he's been focused on all year. And uh, we uh, continue to look for ways to work with Congress, with members of both parties, to uh, get important things done on behalf of the American people. That includes comprehensive immigration reform. There remains an opportunity for Republicans in the House to act on this important matter, something that's supported by a broad coalition of uh, forces on the left and the right, including support from uh, corners that uh, are normally not on board with things President Obama uh, is in favor of. And I think that reflects that uh, this is something that the American people believe ought to get done and which can do enormous good to our economy, to our security, and to our capacity to innovate. So the President looks forward to working with Congress on uh, any area that advances uh, a pro-middle class agenda. Uh, and you know, hopefully Republicans in Congress will respond to that desire. When they don't, when they instead decide to spend the uh, valuable time they have uh, in Congress uh, to instead investigate and investigate and investigate what's already been investigated or to uh, vote to repeal and vote to repeal and vote to repeal uh, a law that's making quality, affordable health insurance available to millions of Americans. Uh, he'll focus on those things that he can do using his administrative authority. Thank you so much for that answer. But I'm strate strategically left out the part about this frustration now. Um, I need to get the now. What is this frustration level now about Benghazi and this latest investigation? The, the president, I think, has. Uh, was new relatively to Washington when he took office. I'd been a senator for a few years, but he's no, no. But let me get there. This is the that's the positive phrase that begins the powerful point. But the uh, <laughs> but he uh, cannot claim to be new anymore, and uh, recognizes that you know partisans are going to practice partisan politics, and uh, that what we uh, see in this effort and in so many others is uh, a desire to and try to score political points, I, in this case with a base uh, of reporters, I guess, uh, uh, instead of focusing at their attention on the matters that can help move the economy forward and uh, reward hardworking Americans for the hard work that they do. Uh, you know, so that's an observation that uh, is not uh, you know, all that gratifying, uh, but it's a fact that has been an obvious reality for some time now, but there remain opportunities, uh, opportunities for uh, bipartisan cooperation like the one I just talked about, and we hope we will continue to look, and the President will continue to look for opportunities to do that with members of Congress, but he will not rest in seeking uh, the ability to and executing on his ability to advance an agenda using his authorities. And on the Carol's question, is the President or anyone here expecting to allot any new monies when it comes to this urgent issue with the Nigerian girl abduction? Uh, look, I think that the policies that we're implementing uh, fall under existing uh, budgetary authorities, but I would uh, refer you to the State Department and USAID for other efforts. Peter Alexander. On Nigeria, is the President considering Alexander. sending American troops or perhaps special forces into Nigeria if asked to help try to find these young women? I have not heard such a request or, or consideration. If requested, would the President be willing well, to consider spe that? speculation, but I have not heard uh, well, even. it's not because there's international outrage and worldwide there have been other leaders. Again, I haven't that heard that. This is the first I've even heard that suggested that we're focused on the policies and the assistance that we uh, that I outlined in my answer Since before. We're wrapping up briefly. We'll ask you on a separate topic. Uh, the first lady's brother was just removed from his position at Oregon State University as the head basketball coach. The president seen the team play on multiple mm -hmm. Hawaii trips. Any comment from the White House or the first lady's well, office I, on that? I would refer you to the uh, to the. Uh, East Wing uh, on matters like that. Uh, I, I haven't talked to the president. Yes, yeah, sure. Come on, Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tragedy in Rhode Island, do you or the president have any thoughts on these kind of stunts that are so dangerous and really shocking to young people? Uh, I don't have a, an official response. Obviously, uh, you know, it was a pretty terrible accident, uh, and our thoughts and prayers goes out, go out to those uh, who were affected. I think I've been uh, given the hook. Thanks, all. Mm -hmm.